Thank you so much, uh, Mehran. Thank you to Zahra and to everyone at uh, CIRS. Um, I'm so grateful and honored that you would organize and host this event uh, here tonight on my behalf. And thanks to you all for being here. Uh, this is truly a special moment for me to have this event right here because SFS Qatar is the place where I wrote the bulk of the dissertation uh, that formed the basis for this book. The two years that I spent here as a research fellow were critical to my ability to both conduct uh, follow-up trips to Egypt at the height of the revolution that was happening during uh, its more hopeful days, let's say. Uh, and while here, I was also fortunate to be surrounded by so many brilliant people uh, who were supportive of my work and gave me critical feedback whenever I needed it. And here I'll, I'll single out Judith Tucker, who was a member of my committee and who also happened uh, to be here right in Doha at the same time that I was writing uh, during those two years, uh, and who's also rejoined us here this term, and we're very happy to have her back. Uh, and for this reason, I think it's critical that we continue to support the research fellow program to give similar opportunities to doctoral candidates from the main campus to benefit tremendously uh, from their time here in the same way that I did. Over the past year and a half, whenever I've done events like this, I'm always delighted by the turnout because I think it serves as a testament to the fact that no matter how much we might be consumed by current events elsewhere, that Egypt is not forgotten. Even as the post-coup order has pursued the rise of a new authoritarianism that's relied on unprecedented use of violence to eradicate popular activism from Egyptian society, whether by the Muslim Brotherhood or by any other group from within Egyptian society. There's still a broad interest in documenting this process and learning the lessons of Egypt's failed revolution in the hopes that this and future generations can use this knowledge of this historical moment in the service of liberating their society and empowering their people. Although I actually set out to do the research for this book before the 2011 revolution, it is in that spirit that I hope that people re will read this book. Uh, I was similarly inspired by the tendency to reduce contemporary conflicts to differences between good and evil, and especially after 9-11, how that tendency had destructive consequences for the relationship between the US and its Western allies on the one hand, and Muslim societies who, in spite of their vast diversity, were all lumped into one category by virtue of Huntington's theory of a clash of civilizations that found currency among leaders in Washington and among militant jihadist movements in the Middle East and beyond. Because of its historical legacy as the leading opposition movement in the region for roughly eight decades, the Muslim Brotherhood seemed like an obvious choice for one to study popular mobilization in the Arab world. The fact that it's quite often misrepresented and leads to reductive and simplistic analyses of political Islam made this project all the more pressing, especially during the last decade and a half. As we observe the eliminationist, dangerous rhetoric employed by the Egyptian regime and its supporters over the last couple of years, I think it's important to go back in time and trace the rise of the most recent incarnation of the Muslim Brotherhood. The generation of current leaders like Mohammed Morsi, Abdel Minam Abu Futuh, Isam al Aryan, Khairat al Shatir, that all of these figures who we've heard so much about in the last three or four years did not emerge in a vacuum. They're the products of a generation that has its roots in the 1970s student movement. That movement demonstrated tremendous dynamism in the development of its activism, enjoyed a complex relationship with the state, and ultimately came to make up the next generation of leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, an organization that had been all but destroyed for nearly 20 year years. This book tells that story. So I'll be reading a couple of selections from the book that offer a hint of the kinds of things that this study explores. The first excerpt is from the introduction. The second is actually from the epilogue. For everything else in between, you'll just have to read the book for yourselves. And afterward, I'll look forward to uh, your questions. Cairo's oppressive summer weather had yet to subside as the third general guide of Gamat al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Society of the Muslim Brothers, languished in the damp heat of an Egyptian prison. It was the fall of 1981, and he had not expected to be back inside so soon. By now an old man, Omar al-Tirmisani was a lawyer by training, but had spent nearly 20 years of his life as a political prisoner. In the decades since his release, however, he had attained a top leadership position in the Muslim Brotherhood and helped restore it to its former status as the chief opposition movement in the country, largely through the successful recruitment of a vibrant student movement. Along with several colleagues from his inner circle, 
Tilmiseni had traveled across the nation, speaking at conferences, attending summer youth camps, and meeting with students on their campuses, preaching the dawah, or call, of the Muslim Brotherhood to tens of thousands of young Egyptians in the process. In contrast to the relative openness that had characterized much of his time in office, on September 5th, President Anwar Sadat ordered state security agents to conduct a massive sweep of the country, arresting hundreds of members of the political opposition in all of its ideological stripes, from Nasserists and Marxists to the Islamic movement, represented chiefly by the Muslim Brotherhood. Feeling threatened by the rising tide of fervent political opposition, Sadat abandoned his rhetoric of, on democracy, opting for a return to the repression that had characterized the era of his predecessor, Gamal Abdel Nasser, by quashing all political dissent. A month later, he would be assassinated. From the confinement of his cell, Tilmisani could do no more than pen his prison memoir, recounting his experiences under the Sadat regime and commenting on the daily news items that trickled into the prison through smuggled newspapers. In one entry, he lamented a news story about Sadat's meeting with the higher council of the press. According to the news article, on his way out of the meeting, Sadat stopped to greet one of the council's members, Ahsan Abdel Quddus, a notable newspaper editor, writer, and liberal commentator. Sadat smiled at his old friend, shook his hand warmly, and spent a moment catching up with him. Though he tried to muster a smile in return, Abdel Quddus could not help but be reminded of the loss of his son, Muhammad, who at that very moment was in an undisclosed location along with hundreds of other activists arrested by Sadat. Muhammad Abdel Quddus was a leader in Al-Gamal Islamiyya, the Islamic society, the powerful organization that represented religious student activists in universities throughout the country. He had also recently joined the Muslim Brotherhood and, carrying on the family tradition, had taken up journalism as a career and a personal passion. But Muhammad did not report for one of the liberal secular newspapers. He was a writer for Al Dawa, the Muslim Brotherhood's monthly magazine. When security agents raided the offices of Al Dawa and arrested the editors and staff members, Muhammad Abdul Quddus was the youngest person apprehended. In commenting on this chance encounter between Egypt's authoritarian ruler and a grieving father, Tilmiseni wavered between unrestrained condemnation of Sadat's behavior and sadness at the pain that Ahsan Abdul Quddus must have felt by coming face to face with the person responsible for his son's dismal fate. Sadat was, quote, flexing his muscles, demonstrating his power, and reproaching Abdul Quddus for allowing his son to go along the path of the call to God. Or, he pondered, was it possible that Sadat was genuinely attempting to flatter his old friend? His, quote, his tenderness did not end with a smile to the father he had deprived of his son. No, not only did he smile at him, but he went out of his way to greet him. Have you ever seen humility more charming than this? Tinmisani concluded sarcastically. This story serves as a symbolic representation of a number of transformative developments of the Sadat era in modern Egyptian history. The anguished father, unable to confront the president in defense of his son, is a testament to the decline of liberalism in Egypt's political culture, which witnessed the replacement of the traditional political forces, the centers of power, as Sadat termed them, with a new political base made up of ideologies antagonistic toward the liberal, nationalist, and radical socialist forces of old. The assumption of leadership by Tirmisani, who expressed his deep outrage at Sadat in no uncertain terms, signaled the arrival of the Muslim Brotherhood as the chief opposition movement leading the popular contention against the state. In fact, Tilmisani's role extended to that of paternal caretaker to Muhammad Abdel Quddus, who along with thousands of young Egyptians joined in this movement at the expense of the ideology of their parents. Finally, Sadat replicated the dualism for which his regime had become known, warmly greeting his friend while knowing that his policies had cost Abdel Quddus and his family much, so much harm. As a leader who in the span of a decade pursued war and peace, populism and free enterprise, democracy and despotism, Sadat was said to have met his untimely demise at the hands of a movement he helped create. Following a turbulent history of social activism, political contention and militant resistance, the Muslim Brotherhood had experienced such a crushing blow early in the Nasser era that few in Egypt would have expected it to appear, to reappear. Yet after two decades of absence from society, the Muslim Brotherhood reemerged as a social movement organization, spreading a religious and political message and expressing its opposition to the state. And here I'll just move to 
the epilogue which attempts to bring this conversation to the present. And so this epilogue chapter I wrote as, as the last uh, part of the book just before it went into publication. And so in many ways it reflects upon uh, the changes that have occurred in Egypt just in the last few years, but specifically on what impact this decade of the 1970s had on uh, the recent events with the 2011 revolution. In her 2008 novel, Farag, or Release, Radwa Ashur tells the story of a generation disillusioned by the broken promises of an unfulfilled revolution. Even after experiencing the estrangement and dislocation caused by her father's political activism and subsequent imprisonment by the Nasser regime, the novel's narrator, Neda, finds herself drawn to the student movement of the early 1970s. The amorphous and non-ideological activism of this generation's youth contrasts with that of the previous one and appears to cast their struggle as much against the failures of their parents as it did the early excesses of Sadat's rule. Before long, Neda too finds herself imprisoned, along with hundreds of her university comrades. Unable to cope with the monumental struggle facing them upon their release from prison, many of Neda's colleagues give in to despair, abandoning a cause that they characterize as, quote, a historic call for the transformation of society toward brotherhood, equality, justice, and happiness. Instead, the characters in instead the characters engage in a prolonged period of self-criticism, internalizing the defeat of their, quote, aborted dream, and experiencing such alienation through the subsequent years that one character dubs her generation the stillborn. The novel's events are based in large part on actual events, including the rise to prominence and abrupt fall of Arwa Saleh and Siham Sabri, leaders of the student movement who may have spent only a short time in Sadat's jails but exhibited a perpetual yearning for true liberation, finding it only upon taking their own lives in 1997 and 2003, respectively. To disentangle the complex social and political realities that would cause two bright and accomplished women to commit such an act in a cultural context in which suicide is seldom visible and rarely discussed, Ashur invokes Michel Foucault's concept of the disciplinary society. The structures and instruments of power as they existed in the authoritarian environment of post nasserist Egypt, meant that not only would the state exercise complete control over the physical bodies of those it segregated from the rest of society through its political use of incarceration, but it ensured that even upon their return to society, dissidents faced a parallel set of constraints. Foucault likens these to the panopticon, a disciplinary mechanism that employs a subtle coercive technique, primarily surveillance, that assumes, quote, the automatic functioning of power. By the time Sadat ordered the roundup of all political dissidents in September of 1981, the process of, subver of subverting popular activism to the whims of the state had become complete. Only two forces proved capable of challenging this arrangement. The militant underground groups who relied on secrecy and violence in their contention against the regime, and the Muslim Brotherhood, with a disciplined and rigid internal hierarchical structure that permitted it to pursue a far-reaching social activist mission. But 30 years later, only the latter demonstrate dur demonstrated durability in the face of continuing state repression. When popular protests erupted across Egypt on January 25, 2011, the Muslim Brotherhood was poised to place its decades of experience in the service of a national movement to overthrow the regime of Sadat's successor, Hosni Mubarak. The movement that occupied Tahrir Square and other major public spaces in urban centers around the country for 18 days was led by students and young professionals and was devoid of any particular ideological orientation. Like the movement that dominated Egyptian campuses in the late 1960s and early 70s, these youth demonstrated strength through unity of purpose, determination, and courage, espousing universal convictions such as freedom, social justice, human dignity, and equality of opportunity for all. In short, they demanded a brighter future than the one their parents faced a generation earlier. Unlike the prior era, however, this period exhibited several critical features that would help determine the outcome of the popular revolt. From the technological advancements that facilitated wider mobilization to the shifts in domestic and international political and economic conditions and the evolution of modes of contention, 
the January 25th movement held an advantage over prior protests. But one can also add to these factors the decades of experience brought to the movement by an entire generation of activists who grew up with the regime and internalized its repressive tactics. Ultimately, as much as the toppling of Mubarak symbolized the coming of age of a cosmopolitan, tech-savvy generation, it also saw the fruition of a seemingly static dream long held by an older cadre of Egyptians. For when the regime began grooming Gamal Mubarak to succeed his aging father over a decade earlier, the country's political order betrayed a more deeply entrenched authoritarianism. As the younger Mubarak, an investment banker by trade, began to assume control of a greater share of Egypt's political and economic institutions, along with the rising oligarch class, a panic set in among the country's activists, resulting in the establishment of the Kifaya movement to oppose the regime's plans for hereditary rule. The unspoken tenor of the emerging national struggle suggested a visceral reaction of the notion that an octogenarian president would hand over the country to a son and his, friend, his friends in their early 40s, effectively bypassing an entire generation. The passionate response with which this project was met served as a testament to the notion that a society could scarcely stand, withstand an assault on the natural order of things. That is, barring a wide swath of the population from public service and the right to contribute to the growth and development of their nation. It is within this context, then, that the political developments in the months following the January 25th uprising should be understood. Barely a year after Mubarak's overthrow, five of the leading candidates to succeed him in Egypt's first democratic presidential elections in history came out of the 1970s generation of student leaders and activists. Their rise to the fore of Egypt's post-revolutionary political scene was no mere accident. Rather, it was the product of a process that had been at work for several decades of the, after the rise of the student movement and the concurrent reappearance of the Muslim Brotherhood as an organized force in Egyptian society. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>